And yeah, the kids can um, the kids can go up now if you like. Um, so it's Philippians chapter one to the end of the chapter, isn't it? This letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the church leaders and deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart. You share with me the special favour of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding For I want you to understand that what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It is true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others who do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ, they preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I've been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honour to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ. And dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I'm torn between the two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because what, of what he is doing through me. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, 
fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am in the midst, still in the midst of it. Okay. Well, we want to welcome um, Gary once again, and Shirley. It's lovely to have both of them here with us. And um, we, I'll let them tell you more about what they're doing, but we're very pleased that we can support them as a church. Welcome. Thank you, Bruce. We are, um, for those of you that are not familiar with us, uh, Gary and Shirley Moore, uh, I grew up here in this church, so it's always good to come back and to uh, be able to, uh, to share what God is, uh, is doing in our lives. We're currently in Malawi, and I'm going to hand it over to Shirley. Since 2020... Move it across. Sorry, we had some few technical difficulties. We've only been in the country a few days, so we're just getting our technology sorted out. Since uh, November 2021, uh, we've been working alongside the staff at the, uh, the uh, Baptist College, uh, Theological College, in Lilongwe, in Malawi. Uh, it's part of Eastern Africa and uh, it's centred on the beautiful uh, Lake Malawi. It makes up 20% of uh, the country uh, side of uh, all the, all the, the landmass, although it's water, of course. Uh, but um, it's one of it's the third largest lake in the African lake system. And if you ever want to come over to uh, Malawi, it has the greatest uh, diversity of freshwater tropical fish. And uh, lots of people come over and scuba dive. The uh, college itself, where we're teaching, uh, it's uh, a college that uh, has two programs, uh, a diploma program and it has a, uh, a Bachelor of Theology program. It's developing mainly Christian leaders and pastors for the churches uh, in Malawi and uh, we do have some international students coming from Zambia and we've had some from Mozambique uh, around, the, around uh, that part of Africa. I personally teach Old Testament, well that's my preference, uh, and Shirley is, uh, is, is going to explain what she's going to do. All right. Okay. Uh, yes, so I teach uh, English communication. Um, the students come from a number of different tribal groups, um, so they will learn the main uh, language of Tichewa at school, but and they will may learn English, but they come to the college um, with uh, not a great um, understanding always. And some of them, for, they have been away from school for some time, and they haven't used English um, in their their villages. But the all the lectures and all the library resources are in English because. Um, they just do not have those resources already written in their own languages and because when you've got that many different tribal groups you have to have a, some common language. Um, so I also, so I particularly focus on that basic English with the first years and then I go on and do also teach some academic writing schools and research schools with the uh, second and third years. Um, we uh, live on campus in uh, one of the staff houses and this also gives us the opportunity to interact with the staff and students in other ways. Uh, we inherited two dogs from some Americans that have gone back to the States, so each day we take the dogs walking around the campus 
um, and it gives us an opportunity to just to talk to the students outside of lectures, see how they are going. We uh, regularly uh, get invites from our former students, uh, which is a, a fantastic thing. So we get to go into many different churches and uh, fantastic experiences all the way from some of the larger churches uh, right down to, well, one time we were right out in, a, in the rainy season in a building that uh, they'd stolen the poles <laughs> and the roof was down. Um, so all variety. It's a very poor country, uh, so churches are, are, are variety. But they're the context in which our students go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we, uh, we, we really appreciate getting that context to help them to be uh, more able to apply God's word in those various contexts. Uh, when the students come to college, they often have barely enough money to pay for their fees and let alone often they, they come and they are often supported by uh, their, their churches and the college uh, no longer supplies them uh, with food regularly so they are expected to uh, source their own food and cook. And everything is done from scratch, so that takes them a very long time. Um, so one of the things we did was to get some support to at least pay for someone to come and prepare their meal. So they provide the food, this person comes in and prepares at least lunch and dinner, so it frees them up a bit more time um, to study. We, I also give them bananas... Uh, during their break in the morning just to keep them going because they often get very tired because they're not eating well. Uh, another thing that happened is that Cyclone Freddie, which came from here and managed to make landfall in Mozambique, continued and went through Malawi. And it was left a devastating trail of death and destruction. Uh, the long way where we are in the centre didn't have much damage but many of our students uh, lost family, they lost crops um, in their villages when it just wiped everything out. So Baptist Mission Australia has been working alongside our team in Malawi to help rebuild some homes, uh, especially where the rest of our team are down in Mangochi, which uh, where Gary talked about the lake, it's at the bottom of that, um, that's where it got worst hit. Uh, so we've also been working alongside the Baptist Convention in Malawi to send food and clothing to those worst hit areas. Can get the next slide, yes. So you will see from the slide, um, the main crop that they grow is maize. Uh, and they normally only get one crop a year. They have a wet and a dry season. So in the wet season, you just got to grow and when you get a cyclone comes through about March, it destroys your crop and you may starve for the next year. So you get the maize, they are there hand drying it out um, and then scraping the, uh, the maize off the, off, the, off the cobs and then they put it out on the ground and they dry it and then they pound it and they make it into maize flour that they call ufa that they turn into a seema, which is a bit like mashed potato, but it's the main food that they eat. Um, so, yeah, so their volunteers came in. Um, this is on the campus where we are and helped them to uh, get some more maize out to the places where they really needed it. So we do all what we can around the place. We joined in a special prayer meeting for uh, for those affected, it was held in the chapel on the campus. The theme for this uh, May Mission Month from uh, Baptist Mission Australia's point of view is to come alongside. And uh, that's a great concept of what mission for us is. We go alongside the people in, uh, in Malawi that we're working with there at the college and the, the local churches and local association. We're here today to ask you to come alongside of us 
as we come alongside those that support uh, support the, 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 the locals. I don't know about you, uh, but uh, this journey for Shirley and I over the last six to, six to nearly eight years of going to Malawi, the one thing that we've learned most of all is the power of prayer. Um, I, as an old engineer, I, I always uh, like to have plan A, B, C, and sometimes D organised. And then some days we wake up and we're starting to think about E, F and G. Uh, that's life in Malawi. And uh, we would ask you, please pray for us. Um, it's just the endurance uh, to be able to think about plan E, F and G sometimes is, is what we're asking for. But more than that, pray for our students. Uh, the students that we are teaching are the next generation of pastors, Christian leaders in Malawi. In, uh, in Africa, as a general context, they talk about faith being ankle deep. Uh, we, on a Sunday morning, you cannot help but know it's Sunday morning in Malawi. Everyone's on their way to church. Um, and that's why many people find it strange that we are, uh, have been called to go to the college. But faith is ankle deep. The, uh, when you scratch the surface, particularly in the villages, just below the surface, animistic belief is still there. The, the, the presence of the evil spirits is very much real. People in, in that context are, uh, are probably just as likely to go to the local shaman as they are to, uh, to come to their pastor and ask for prayer. Please pray for our students that will and are making a difference uh, in their part of the world. How can you help us? Well, we regularly send our uh, newsletter out. Thank you, Ron, for sending it out and uh, to, to not just people here, but to many other places. So thank you so much. We, uh, we appreciate that sense of, of people not only knowing what we're doing, but praying for us. Not just praying for Gary and Shirley, but for the things that are coming up for us. We appreciate that greatly. The financial support that the church gives us is fantastic. Shirley's already talked about that. Because you support us, we can support the college, we can support the students. Uh, being there, um, we've just been amazed what difference it, it makes. Uh, I suppose for many of us, uh, the old idea of the cargo cult of the missionary and the way we, we change and influence a, a community can be a scary one because some of the legacies that past missionaries have left behind uh, are not always good ones. But um, even the fact that we're in Lilongwe, uh, we have a, 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 a man that comes and looks after our garden for us and does various jobs. Uh, he's got a job because we're there. Um, we're able to, to uh, gradually talk more to more uh, at him and find about his faith and journey but his life is uh, is certainly been uh changed and improved there's so many little ways about that but but we but because you support us we're able to to go and to help make a difference in malawi um we particularly uh here in australia at this time we've finished our first term we're going back uh, hopefully in September uh, sometime uh, so we can resume uh, teaching at the college but uh, we need people's support and so we thank you for your continued support and we look forward to that support for our next term. One of the we've been going to Malawi since 2016 and one of the very first things that we saw was in uh, Malawi the electricity supply is uh, abysmal, can I say it that way. Uh, there's just not enough production of electricity in that country. They're trying to get more people on the grid and that system is under great stress. And uh, we I have often lost power for up to 10, day, 10 hours a, a day. That's something we can cope with. But when the power goes off at the college, the lights go off and that can be at night that can be during the day we see our fellow lecturers wandering around because when the power goes off and many of them are now on computers and many of them have very poor uh, battery backup uh, 
they're walking around the campus because there's only so much they can do. And the students at night, I was talking to an old student of ours and he was just talking about remembering the, the, the days when he was studying and uh, trying to study by candlelight. Um, for many of them, that was the only source of how they could study at night. Um, it's a big project that uh, the college wants us to be partner with them about, and that's to keep the lights on. To keep the lights on, and as a college advances, we, ha we have uh, a lot of our, our um, technology is improving. It's still antiquated to compare to Australia. But our students, when we first went in 2016, just about every student had to handwrite all of their assignments. Uh, as we try to pick up our game, more and more are uh, emailing their, stu their uh, essays in and all of that sort of thing. So without the power on, it makes their job that much harder. So we're asking you to partner with us to keep the lights on at the college. One of the, th the sorry, via the solar panels, of course, but that's the project. Um, finally, uh, our students, Malawi, and I know everyone has been doing it tough since COVID, everyone's been doing it tough since the uh, Ukrainian-Russian war. Uh, things have certainly uh, changed across the world. But when you're living amongst the poorest of the poor, they get affected far more than anyone else. And uh, the college fees have had to increase Student, student scholarships are becoming more and more uh, and student support is becoming one of the crises for the college just so the students can stay and study. Every, uh, if there's a reason for a student to come and knock at our door, um, many of the times they're asking for some form of support. So um, we're asking you to, uh, to consider thinking about the, the scholarship scheme for our students and uh, pray for others to support that scholarship scheme as well. But most of all, we're here to say thank you. Thank you to Wentworth Hill Baptist for supporting us because by that support, you're helping the next generation of uh, Christian leaders and pastors, evangelists and missionaries uh, in Malawi. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. We're... Um, turning to this beautiful, well, when I say this beautiful passage the, in Philippians, it, uh, we particularly want to think about verses 3 to 6. And in 3 to 6, we, uh, we have this whole concept of partnering, Paul's concept of partnering. And so that's what we want to do today. Let's pray before we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for your word. We thank the, you that you are a powerful God. You are the powerful God that's not only made this world but sustains it. So, Lord, as you call us to partner with what you're doing, help us, Lord, to hear from your word the challenge for today. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Shirley and I have been married for over 30 years. Um, if you know us, we are quite different people in many ways. Uh, but as we've worked together as a couple on some of those differences, but some of those uh, things that we have in common, God's done amazing things. Uh, you don't know our, many of you don't know our two children, but uh, we think they've done amazing having grown up as pastor's kids uh, for uh, many years. Uh, I was a pastor uh, in... Uh, three, four of our churches across the, the state. We've been here for, uh, before we went to Malawi. Uh, somehow they've come up and I think they're reasonably well adjusted. We think. You can make the critique later on. Uh, we've been able to go to the Baptist Theological Seminary of Malawi and uh, we've been called to go there, not only by the mission, but the college has uh, encouraged us to come back. Even more amazing. Because God has given us gifts. And our gifts are quite different. The very first time we, I was asked to go overseas to uh, teach at a small college in, um, in uh, Yangon in Burma, uh, Shirley came along and she came along to support me. Moving across cultures is a, is a, is a struggle. 
and uh, has its, its features. So it's great to have a good partner with you. The interesting thing was that as I started to do a bit of teaching on the Psalms, our friend who asked us to come found out an amazing thing. Shirley's uh, a graduate, uh, she's a librarian, but her primary uh, qualifications are in English literature and grammar. She's our grammar Nazi in our family. She still corrects me and you'll see her on the way out. I'll make a mistake. She'll fix me up on the way out. But nevertheless, uh, our friend found out when he was struggling as a cross-cultural person trying to teach English that Shirley actually had some skills that were useful. And ever since we've uh, gone overseas, uh, she's taught English as a second language or grammar or some, some, some subset of all of those uh, skills while I've gone off and taught Old Testament or some other biblical subject. Um, God's put us together for a purpose and a reason. And as we partner together, we do more together. And uh, that's one of the great things about partnership. It's one of the great things about marriage. It's one of the great things that Paul in this passage is trying to get across to us today. That here we see partnering in life and ministry is something that is of great value. And so in, in Philippians chapter uh, 1, 3 to 5, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from that very first day until now. We want to talk today about partnerships. And one of the first things that we need to understand is we are people who partner. We're coming here today because without our partnership with this church and uh, nearly 30 other churches and individuals right across this state, we don't get to do the job that we are called to do. Partnering is part of what we are, we value, and I know this church values by your partnership with Baptist Mission Australia and us. But Paul here reminds us it's not a new concept. It's part and parcel of what the, the early church was all about. Without Paul partnering with the church at Philippi, what was going to exist? Paul was an apostle. He went and planted churches, but the churches were always left behind. But they had, a, they had to stand on their own two feet but they also were an important part of the overall ministry of the early church as it grew. Often we think of uh, Paul. I don't know what your images are, but I think of Paul as this man that's out there. He's, uh, we hear about him going around, uh, around uh, Asia and Europe, sharing the gospel, growing and planting churches. And often we think of this guy that's out there doing it all on his own. But when you actually read his own writings and you read what he's left behind for us in God's word, we hear about a man that greatly values partnership. He wasn't just a person that did it all himself. Now, that's, this is not the only occasion in the New Testament where we hear about this passion of partnership. We see him doing it in many ways. I think of the uh, other great sense of, uh, of mission when the church in Jerusalem was struggling. He went out and raised with many of the churches the concept of a collection. You guys have benefited because the church in Jerusalem sent me out and you should uh, therefore think about how do you support them because they're doing it tough. That sense of partnership, not just in the local church, but the global church. In 2 Corinthians 8 and elsewhere, we hear about that. I think one of the ones that I really enjoy the most is when we think about uh, his relationship with Timothy. It's a, it's a very dear and tender one. It's a, it's a, a father-son almost like relationship, a, a mentor-mentee type relationship. But he values it. Paul knew and understood the, the value of relationship. I love coming back to, to Wenty. Now, I don't know all of your faces, 
Uh, most of you know my sister, so that's uh, Julie. So that's a, that's a connection. But some of you um, knew me when I was this high and you still love me. <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful thing. And it's always nice to have those old uh, friends that uh, are there to support and encourage us. That sense of partnership is at the heart of what the church is really about. Going to Malawi for us uh, was a challenge, but knowing that we have support here in Australia to pray for us, to support us, to encourage us, even to read our newsletter. And it's wonderful when so many people respond and actually uh, send those personal notes. We appreciate that. We partner and uh, because we are also people who are, are people who partner in love. In John 13, 35, uh, 13 to 35, we read these words. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know my disciples if you love one another. When I was a busy pastor, and I am a busy pastor, I'm just a lecturer, I have a slightly different title these days in Malawi, uh, but um, there's uh, not a, a week that would go by in, in our various communities, whether it was in Wellington or in Newcastle or even down the road at Villawood when we were first starting out. Um, it was a, a, it, there wasn't a time when there was some community crisis or need in the community. It, um, it's, it's always a struggle. Uh, life has a way of, uh, of, of bringing things along at the most unexpected times. And as a pastor, uh, we always seem to be in the pointy end of that, uh, that, that, that sector. And dealing with needs is always difficult. In Malawi, the cost of living pressures uh, are high and we uh, see the individual struggle of so many of our neighbours in the community in which we live. Re needs are real. And so we know that in mission, uh, and, and so even in this church, you have constant demands on your, uh, on your resources as individuals and as a community of faith to support various needs and to support people in your community. It's uh, great to hear the food bank doing so well and uh, reaching many needs in your community. And uh, there are so many ways that things go on. But when we, when we partner and we care in love, we're expressing God's love when we hand on a gift, when we support somebody in our community. We are showing God's love in, uh, in those places. Indeed, one of the messages that uh, the students and the staff at the college wanted us to come back to convey in person with, uh, with the churches and the individuals that support us is that word of thanks. They know your love because you put it in very practical ways and putting dollars and cents to get us on the plane to get to Malawi. And they see it in many practical ways when students receive scholarships. They know you love because you have given and supported them. Through Baptist Mission Australia's scholarship and support schemes, we've, uh, we've helped many students to complete. Last Saturday, we, um, we had a beautiful, beautiful occasion of uh, the students' graduation service. And uh, we were looking out and we were looking at the uh, number of students because you guys care, their lives were changed. They were able to complete their studies and they will be doing great ministry. But the, the, the most important thing that we go over to do, the most important thing that we go to do is to partner with the church in Malawi is their part of the Great Commission. Now, I know these words are familiar words, and what a powerful day after we think about the day of Pentecost, because this has the day of Pentecost 
at its heart. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Today we think about Pentecost, the coming of the Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Ultimately, the college and the students are about the Great Commission. In Malawi, we've already talked about the sense that there is this level of faith across the community, across the country. It's, uh, in many aspects, it has a greater depth of, or spread, shall I say, of the Christian faith than we do here in Australia. And yet, some of the least reached people with the gospel exist in the, 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 the country of Malawi. Baptist Mission Australia has been going to Malawi for over 30 years. The Christian gospel has been in Malawi since David Livingston went all those years ago. And uh, he went through this part of the world. And so the gospel has been there. And yet there are groups in Malawi that still do not know Jesus in any significant way. And the message that needs to get to them is still important for them to hear in their own language, in a way that they can understand by real people that can show what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this is what is at the heart of Baptist Mission Australia and our work that continues in Malawi. We're a, a little bit different than the rest of the team. The rest of the team are working in, the, in rural and urban communities amongst a particular group of people called the Owls. The Owls uh, were a group of, um, a, a tribal group that sided in that horrible period of time, uh, the slave trade era. They sided with the, uh, the, the Arab slave traders. Uh, they profited off the suffering of their people and they've taken on the religion of their, uh, their business partners, which were uh, obviously Muslims. Um, so to be Yao is to be Muslim. So many, many years ago, some of the colleagues that I went through theological college with at Morling uh, became some of the missionaries that uh, went and shared the gospel. The work is growing, and we praise God for that. Um, but again, there's much more that still needs to be done. The exciting thing about our ministry is, uh, although we are not going into the the, uh, the Yao uh, villages in the same way. But you know what? The people were training. A number of them are Yao's. Every year that we've been there, we've found Yao's that have found Jesus. we found Yao's that want to come and to be trained, not just to know more about Jesus, but you know what they want to do? They want to go back to their own people. They want to go back and share the love of Jesus with them to show the difference that Jesus can make and has made in their lives. And that's exciting. We can help and equip them to do what we can't do. We're struggling at the moment. Um, I can say to you, Mulabanji, that's a, a welcome uh, in, uh, in Chichewa. Uh, but uh, in our country, Malawi, there are 13 significant language groups. Um, and, that's, and we're a country that is half the size of, uh, sorry, twice the size of Tasmania, half the size of Victoria. Uh, it's this long, thin little country. So it's a confusing country to be a part of where you have so many different language groups. We meet a guy from time to time on our daily walk and we're thinking we're doing very well when we say Mulabanji, Mulabanji, welcome in the morning. And then he says, ah. I'm not Chichewa, I'm from the north, I'm a Tambuka, greet me this way, and my head is just exploding. I think, I'm just struggling to understand this. Language. But you know the students we get to teach? They know Yao, they know the culture, they know all of those things. When we equip them, when we train them, they can go back into that culture and they're accepted because they're Yao. They're not a sungu. We're, we, we're white, we're foreign, we're different. We're called a sungu. 
We're not that. They're not that. They are able to go in and share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what excites us. Several years ago, one of the stu first students Shirley taught um, in her, as she teaches English as a second language, because in our college, they have to study in English. But one of the very first stu students she taught, when he graduated, he was able to partner with Baptist Mission Australia and go down and to work with our people down south. Uh, the, our team leader down there said, Gary, if there's one thing you can do, send me more of him <laughs> down there. We need more of them. People that can think, uh, in, uh, think in terms of their theological understanding and sharing the good news, but yet be equipped, know the language, know the culture, be able to talk to the people. You see, sharing the gospel in Malawi in places like that is still tough. We've, uh, we've had a number of students that are either Yao or, or have, um, have had a passion to go and share the gospel amongst them, and they find how difficult it is in that context, particularly those that, haven't, uh, that have not, tried, not been grown up in those areas. It's a tough ministry but they need to be equipped to be able to do it. But when I come back to Australia, the one thing that I know and I remember, one of the things that we struggle with, whether it's in Wellington, whether it's in Newcastle, whether it's in Villawood, is sharing the gospel today is tough. Sharing the gospel today is tough. It has many, many challenges that uh, you and I face when we try to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I could see Bruce's face when I talked about 13 different language groups. And he was saying, ah, oh, that's easy. What are you, do you know what Wellington's, what Wentworth Hill is like today? <laughs> Every time we go down to, to Wenty Shopping Centre these days and we walk past, you think about the same dynamic. How many different language groups do you pass as you walk through that shopping centre? If that's not challenging enough, go to Parramatta <laughs> and think about it. You see, we all face that challenge. How do we reach somebody? Even if they can come back to you or me, when I say g'day, if they can understand my language. You know, in Malawi, when I say g'day, they don't. <laughs> I've got to think. I've got to think. You've got to be able to, uh, to communicate. Partnering in mission is always one of those things. But I look around your congregation this morning and God's put lots of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, from different religious backgrounds, from different cultural backgrounds. He's put you here for a purpose and a reason. Because mission is not just about sending a sungu, <laughs> sending Shirley and I over to Malawi. Mission is about here. We really appreciate the fact that you get that mission is not just about over there. It's about here. It's not just about here or just about there. It's about right across this world. The Great Commission is about what? Going into all the nations. We love it when we come to churches like this that get that picture. It's not a small picture. It's a big picture. And when you walk out and go to Woolworths it's in, uh, down the, on the highway and you see the world walking past you, he may, God may not have put you there for every single one of those, but he will put you there for a purpose and a reason to share the good news of Jesus Christ with either your neighbour, with, with the people that you can relate to, you can share the good news with. And he's put you in a community here so we can do our part of that big picture. So we say thank you. We say thank you today for, that, uh, for you to, be our, uh, to support us. But we want to assure you that we also pray for you as you have a tough job here to, to do as well, in your context, in your place. So thank you. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are the God that created this beautiful world. You are the God of diversity, Lord of different languages, different cultures, different um, even temperatures across uh, this world. So, Lord, we, we pray that you've put us here for a purpose and a reason, for a time and a season. And so, Lord, I want to pray, Lord, for the church here at Wentworthville. Lord, uh, in, in this, this community that is constantly changing and evolving, Lord, even as we came this morning seeing buildings being knocked down and new ones built up, Lord, you're bringing a new community. Lord, I pray for this place that is a lighthouse into this community. And Lord, we, we, we think of those 30, 30 plus groups and families that have been uh, influenced through the food bank program, that have been supported and encouraged, that have experienced your love through your people. We say thank you for that ministry. We thank you for the youth group. We thank you for the, uh, the church service here on Sunday. And we thank you, Lord, for many of us that are able to gossip the gospel over the back fence. Lord, whatever context you put them in, these your people. Bless them, use them, and, uh, and Lord, may you grow your church here in, uh, in Wentworthville, Lord. We pray that. And Lord, we pray for these people that have got the concept of the Great Commission. Lord, may you pray we pray that, that they'll not only be praying for us, but, Lord, for all those different missions that you've connected them with, with those people across this globe, Lord, sharing the good news. Lord, be with them as a, as a church that thinks local but can also pray globally. And, Lord, I pray for this group. Lord, out of this church... Lord, you have raised and brought people into ministry.